So this is going to be a disruptive talk. I've uh, stepped back from the usual type of things, tried to learn a few lessons from uh, some of my uh, previous uh, life lessons and research and so on, and I uh, want to talk to you a bit about where I think uh, this group has the potential to go. Uh, a little bit in the whole concept of advancing science and rethinking how we go forward. Uh, there is a little bit of overlap with the talk I gave at the Hog Day, and oh, good, Don's here. Um, I don't remember uh, a thing. You don't remember, that's okay, I don't expect you to. So, uh, but some slides might be vaguely uh, familiar because we usually have better visual memory than conceptual memory. Um, <laughs> but uh, that talk was called We Are Cavemen. And this is this notion that we're actually practicing pretty primitive medicine. A and Don asked a very sort of piercing question I've given a lot of thought to. And that was, uh, Andrew, if it's all so complicated, we have to start somewhere. You can't just be the sky is falling. And so that's what I've been thinking about. So thank you very much, Don, and, and others along with me. So uh, the first thing I did is I asked, what does FEST stand for? So in fact, FEST doesn't stand for anything. I assumed it was an acronym, because this is cardiology for after all. Um, so uh, so I, I made up, maybe it's called uh, you know, frolicking in an ethereal state of tomfoolery or something like that. Um, presumably, it's sort of the uh, short version of what we now use as festival. Uh, but I, I was going to propose uh, that we call it a Festival for Enlightened Study of Teamwork. Because I think actually going forward, the part of my message is this is how we're going to make it really go forward. Okay, so I want to tell you about George. I have a distinct memory of George as a CCU attendant. Uh, this is about two years ago. And I tell patients this story all the time. So uh, George comes in, he's an unremarkable guy. He's uh, 54, he has a few risk factors, but not too much. Smokes the odd cigar on weekends, a pretty happy guy. And he comes in with acute coronary syndrome. Unremarkable. And he says to me, he's sort of one of these engaging, talkative guys. He says, why me? Why now? Why did this happen? Uh, and so, how many of you have been asked this question? All of us have been asked this question. We cannot predict acute events in clinical medicine. We just do not understand it, okay? So, we thought, well, what do we do with ACS, right? We cath them, right? I said, uh, well, I think I know why this happened, right? You know, we've got a terrible acute coronary tight lesion. This would make anybody have a problem like this. Uh, I think we have a good explanation. But he was a curious guy. And he said, okay, now you told me why, you know, now you said I have a narrowing. But why yesterday? In fact, that's a really good question, right? So the next day, I came back and I said, how are you, George? And he said, I figured it out, Doc. I figured it out for you. And I said, uh, what do you mean? And he says, I, I, this happened to me because of chili. I had a bowl of chili. I have never had chili. I always thought I wouldn't like chili. And my neighbor convinced me to try some chili. And the next day I had chest pain. What else can it be? Right? So what do we do? We say, well, you know, when we stand here and talk to infarct patients, we don't hear them say, oh, I just had chili. Otherwise we'd have figured this out, right? So, and in fact, we don't have any biologic reason to believe that chili should cause this. So, we dismiss it, right? So we say, oh, chili can't be part of acute infarction. That's not possible. But in the end, we sort of walk away. We talk about cholesterol. We talk about the usual stuff. But have we actually explained why this happened to jo poor George? No, okay? I don't think we have at all. And so, in fact, my message is that we do not understand the dynamic nature uh, of disease. We understand the acute nature. We practice fire extinguisher medicine uh, for the most part. We understand a little bit about progression of disease as we see patients periodically over time. Uh, but in fact, we understand relatively little about why things happen acutely, including the loss of your slides. <laughs> okay, well, I've got my talk in front of me, so we can sort of rock on. I presume uh, uh, John Mancini, you're looking pensive. Can you raise your hand if you can still see the slides? Okay, oh, no. no slides. Okay, see, so, so one of my messages that you'll see later on is that we need to improve communication. Uh, oh, and we're back, lovely, okay. So, thank you, John. So, first of all, uh, our first step, which I think we're underway with, and I'll show you some evidence about this in a number of different areas, is to, in fact, record the dynamic nature of disease and record those acute events and then try to understand when we look back at what happened. The next thing we can do is then 
simultaneously and with that information, get our heads around the complexity of disease and try to think broadly and work as a team on that. That, I think, will put us in a position to say, can we change the trajectory of the disease? Can we alter how it works out? And maybe even when we understand all of that, we have more information to actually prevent the disease. And this is sort of conceptual thinking, not specific, but it does apply to almost everybody's area. So, an area dear to my heart is sudden death. Uh, this is a tragedy, it's a painless way to go, uh, but there are many situations where um, sudden death is an issue. And this is a young woman who came to see me, and she's 19, and uh, her mother died uh, suddenly at the age of 35. Uh, her mother was an IV drug abuser, but apparently had cleaned up. And what was odd was that she'd had some palpitations. She'd gone to see a physician. Uh, they were doing a Holter monitor, and she actually died suddenly during the Holter monitor. So we have more information than you would expect. This had actually happened in Toronto years <coughs> before. Uh, and, uh, but she came to me running a genetics clinic to ask, why did my mother die? Is it something that could affect me? So. Here's, uh, unfortunately, a poor quality copy of her ECG. Uh, and without going into great detail, it's fairly underwhelming. She had an echo that was normal. So there was nothing about her that was particular risk. She had no uh, personal symptoms. Uh, she didn't know much about her extended family, but there was no extended family of problems. And with some work, it took about six months and a bunch of calls and forms and everything, we did, were able to get her, original, her mom's original Holter. So here we're going along and looking at her uh, recording. It looks pretty un unremarkable. And then mom gets these little flurries of PVCs. Um, little non first PVCs, it sets up by Gemini, then couplets, then a little run. Uh, then that run becomes more sustained. That rapid polymorphic VT turns into VF. And that VF turns into fine VF. And then that turns into no more mom. Okay? So this is terrible, right? 35-year-old woman, uh, you know, a little bit of a rocky past, but she certainly didn't have this coming. And so now the question is, how big a problem is this? Um, how do we know about this tragedy? How can we, could we have prevented it? So <laughs> the numbers are a little bit dated here, but part of this is how big the problem is. Uh, it's that this number of 40,000 might be more like about 30,000. If you're a little cynical, maybe 20,000 people in Canada die suddenly every year. That's 2,500 people in BC drop dead every year. Okay? So th I don't think that's a trivial problem. I can tell you for sure our enterprise of implanting ICDs in people who we think are at the highest risk does not address the fact that the most people who drop dead don't have advanced cardiac disease. So Fundamentally, we don't really understand the disease to understand how to identify and predict the risk mm -hmm. to prevent it from happening. We are reacting, not enacting the solution. So that's a lot of people, because when you have a cardiac arrest, you don't die. So cardiac arrest or sudden death claims more lives than AIDS, breast cancer, stroke, lung cancer combined. Uh, a very controversial thing happened that some of you might remember about five years ago. Heart and Stroke Foundation sent out a flyer saying, what is this woman at risk for? And the answer was, she was 10 times more likely to die of heart disease than of breast cancer. That really pissed off the cancer people. <laughs> okay? But among other things, it sends the message that is, this is a big deal. Okay? And sometimes when Granny's 89 and she dies in her sleep at the nursing home, it's a blessing. But there's lots of tragedies in the sudden death business. Okay. Examples that are probably more dear to your practice, because some of us are we're relatively siloed in our clinical activities, are illustrated here. So heart failure exacerbation, atrial fibrillation, syncope, asthma, COPD. These diseases all have flare-ups. We typically are not very good at predicting them. And uh, the cost of these, these are staggering implications on us, either as taxpayers or family members okay. or whatever you want to call it. Um, so not understanding catastrophic disease or disease flare-ups, so the dynamic nature of disease is something that's uh, been on my mind since Don Sin asked me that question. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about the scientific method and how we uh, solve problems in medicine. And I'm going to uh, argue that this is only a small part of the solution. So the first thing we do is we say, okay, let's talk about whatever is in your realm. Uh, and we have a hypothesis about what that disease is. Let's, let's talk about heart failure, for example. So then what we do is we say, well, let's try to understand all the things that contribute to heart failure, everything that there is about heart failure. Put this in a model. And then what we want to do is say, well, let's change something. Let's take one of the variables, alter it, and then see what happens with the model. And then if it does what we predict, or it doesn't, we take out the null hypothesis, then we say, okay, well, now we've got some results. 
Let's see if that fits with our notion of why heart failure happens or why it gets worse or how calcium regulation impacts it or something like that. So that's how we do the scientific hypothesis. So here's an example. We have an outcome and here's all these variables. Here are all the things that we could talk about any uh, type of condition that you're involved with. And what we're trying to do is figure out how they impact the uh, outcome. So what we do is, and the people who do bench research here, you fix everything in the model except one variable. And then you alter that variable, and then you see what that does to outcome. Okay? And so then we say, well, if we raise calcium levels, this is what happens with heart failure. Or if we lower intracellular calcium levels, this is what happens with heart failure. And then we say, okay, so as a result, calcium does this in heart failure. Okay? I know it's not that simple. So what it doesn't take into account is that all of these things have complex interactions, very complex interactions. And I'll show you a, a good practical model of this coming up sh shortly. So then what we do is we, we think, okay, now we've got this figured out. We, we've tried to discount those interactions and so on. So let's take atrial fibrillation and uh, potassium channels, one of the potassium channels that's the dominant repolarization uh, current at low heart rates, IKR. And let's change that up. Uh, and let's see what impact it has, because we know that repolarization, atrial repolarization, is part of vulnerability to uh, atrial fibrillation. So let's take out that IKR, let's block it with sodalol. It's a nice, relatively uh, effective uh, potassium channel blocker, and see what effect it has on atrial fibrillation. So here is the victory of modern therapeutics. Sodalol is twice as likely as placebo at correcting your atrial fibrillation. Great drug. Right? Except the number of people in sinus rhythm a year later, 25%. Right? Odds ratio 2, hazard ratio 2, it's a very effective drug. But in fact, most people are not gaining a benefit. And 1% of these people get uh, doctor-acquired long QT syndrome and have high risk for sudden death and so on. So, you know, th this notion of modern therapeutics that we've got it figured out because we've got this model and we know IKR and Sotalol can help with atrial fibrillation. Some patients are better, but we were, I don't think we're going to see Sotalol as some kind of enlightened therapy down the road. Okay, so let's talk about a man with syncope. Here's another case. So here's, here's uh, this gentleman is 48. He uh, is an office worker. He has a history of mild hypertension. He takes a thiazide diuretic. Uh, and uh, he's at work. He gets up from his desk. He feels a little unwell. Uh, and the <coughs> next thing he remembers, he's lying on the floor looking up. Somebody's called 911. Everybody's going, Jim, are you okay? Jim, are you okay? So, uh, because he calls 911, he comes to the emergency room. He's actually conked his head on the corner of a, of a desk. And uh, so he has a scalp laceration. His pressure's okay. His heart rate's okay. His physical findings are unremarkable. And his, uh, as an adolescent, he fainted. A classic vasovagal after a growth spurt. Uh, but he, three years ago, he had an episode he doesn't remember really well, but he had another episode at work where he lost consciousness. So, this is a little bit concerning. One of the little tips in, uh, in syncope is to go through a detailed history. So, this is not what his co-workers saw, but this is representative of what a co-worker might see. <laughs> okay, so this is called situational syncope or micturition syncope. Okay? So what do we know? Syncope is typically caused by cerebral hypoperfusion. Uh, and the better term for it is actually transient loss of consciousness, so it doesn't get mixed up with, uh, with uh, epilepsy and a neuro primary neurologic presentation. Uh, the best test is a thoughtful history. His risk of recurrence, if we take a population science approach to this, is somewhere between 20 and 50 percent, depending on the definition of a syncope burden. Uh, if you're wondering about driving, this is a sort of shameless promotion of some really helpful apps that exist that you can get at the CCS website uh, or at the App Store. Um, he is not very worried. He just said, oh yeah, I fainted, I was dumb, I should have sat down. His wife, of course, is terrified. Okay? So his short-term risk in the next day or two is very low because his findings are unremarkable. He does not apparently have a structurally abnormal heart. Uh, but the point is, Sync could be three years ago, sync could be today. What are the chances that we're going to be there next time? We need to be there next time to figure this out because all of our uh, profile tests are going to give us limited information about what's going on. So imagine that you're managing diabetes, okay? And uh, uh, this diabetic uh, comes to your office and he says, Doc, I need some advice of whether I should go on insulin. Uh, I was diagnosed three years ago, 
Uh, I did my blood sugar back in November. It was kind of a little up. Uh, you check his sugar and it's a bit high, but not too high. And you're trying to answer the question, do I need insulin? This is how we manage heart failure. We do an echo today. We ask the patient what's been going on. We have no idea what his filling pressure is, what his function is, what his electrolytes are, what his loading is, what his, all the parameters that are in the complex model of heart failure are being evaluated right now. They're not being evaluated dynamically over time. And so as a result, would you manage diabetes that way without a series of blood sugars, without a hemoglobin A1C? That would be prehistoric. Right? So most of what we are doing is actually this kind of profile medicine approach to things because we don't actually have a handle on the dynamic nature of disease. <coughs> so here's the perfect test. You lose consciousness in the ICU all instrumented. Right? So we know what your respiratory status, your ECG, your blood pressure. In principle, we could be doing EEG monitoring. Uh, and all of those things would actually tell us what's going on. You'd have an expert observe this to make sure that it's objective and we know what's going on. Uh, it would be uh, accessible, inexpensive, and 100% sensitive and specific. Wouldn't that be perfect? We've got a long ways to go, but we're making progress. Okay, so if I'm telling you things are a little bit more complicated, I would draw your, uh, your uh, attention to this paper, which is a lovely paper that talks about cardiovascular networks. And part of this is to ask particularly the clinicians to step back and recognize that most of the things that we're dealing with are immensely more complex than how we approach our day-to-day -day lives. Patient comes into clinic and heart failure and the question is more diuretic, less diuretic, bump up the spironolactone. These are practical and important questions, but in the end, they don't think in complex terms. Um, so what I liked about this is, uh, this paper is, so this is a paper that talks about the complex interactions that happens in different components of models. And the legend to this figure said, simplified figure <laughs> of the constituents known to regulate adipose tissue in a mouse, okay? So we're bigger and smarter than mice, I hope. Um, but our biologic pathways have to be at least this complex. And this is the simplified version, okay? So I can't keep this in my head. Maybe Bruce or Mark can, I certainly can't. So we need each other and we need computers to be able to use this kind of information to actually advance what's happening in our understanding in our patients. So, uh, networking. How many people know who the person is on the left side of this slide? Okay, so I'm gonna guess that was about a third of you. So this is the head of neurology in this hospital. Okay, and only a third of you know who Alistair is. Now he happens to be my golf partner who I met at the golf course just by accident. Okay, so now, now I have a friend who's a neurologist. So now I can, you know, when we talk about cases that I see, I've got immediate weekly access to a neurologist. It's great, okay? And, uh, but if you look at our office configurations, our water cooler opportunities, those kind of things, we need to connect and communicate more. And this, this is the most simplest form of, uh, of, uh, of networking. Oh, my daughter sent me that picture. Um, so let's start with uh, my journey in the whole, uh, as we go back to our case of the guy who lost consciousness and how we try to say, how can we be there next time? So if you think back to the technology, pacemakers, which are about 50 years old now, have the ability to record the heartbeat and treat it in the event that there isn't a heartbeat <coughs> after one second later after the last one. So a pacemaker is a cardiac monitor. So, an engineer and my previous mentor and now friend, George Klein, said, uh, gee, why don't we just take the monitoring capabilities of a pacemaker and, then, and turn that into what at the time was called a syncope monitor. So this was, uh, this was actually my second day of fellowship. We put in uh, the prototype syncope monitor. Pretty cool. So this is, if you see here, that what the figure illustrates is, um, this, so this is a dual chamber pacemaker with the wires removed. So, uh, so we have one recording electrode here, one recording electrode here. And we took patients who had syncope, recurrent syncope, all tests had been negative, ongoing syncope. We did EP studies, nothing happened. Tilt tables, nothing happened. Put 25 of these in, and in 88% of them, we got a symptom rhythm correlation. So this was a big step forward in figuring out what happens next time they lose consciousness. This was, 
pretty basic technology at the time, but this was the beginning of that journey of trying to be there next time or get a little bit of dynamic information. And so it turns out that we can match whatever we're monitoring uh, with the frequency of events. So if you have syncope every week, then a Holter monitor is likely to be a very useful test. But if it happens like this guy every three years, you need a whole different approach to understanding what's going to happen. And then predicting, ideally, is where we would like to go so that he doesn't have to lose consciousness for us to get to the bottom of this. So what I want to do now is talk to you through a little bit of advances that have happened in all of our realms to some degree that are the promise of getting more information about dynamic disease. So uh, this is just an example of the, the device that we ended up, um, which is now the commercial product, which is an implanted loop recorder. And the ability now for this device to communicate with us by internet so the patient could lose consciousness, have events, record things, and send that information to us without ever leaving their home. Okay? So that's a meaningful step forward in managing these patients from Prince George who don't have to fly here to figure out what's going on. Um, and what we can tell these patients is, if you have a device and you've had recurrent syncope, the chance that we're going to figure this out is 50% within two months, 75% within six months. So we can give people advice about how long it takes to make a diagnosis in general, what the likelihood is of making a diagnosis, and most importantly, when they can drive again. So more basic things have changed too. So this is Norman Holter. This is the original Holter paper from 1961. So, a little bit bulky, maybe. <laughs> so, so this isn't Norman's uh, grandson, uh, but this is somebody who obviously exercises regularly and gets some sun. Uh, I, you do, I don't suppose there's any commercial implication to the, uh, to the model wearing this. So, this is where Holter monitoring is going. So, this device is called iRhythm. Uh, catchy name. Uh, there's a whole series of about five companies that will likely make some kind of patch like recording electrode. This stays on for up to 14 days. All the information is self-contained. It's waterproof. You put it on, two weeks later you take it out, take the memory stick out, put it in, send it to the recording center and they send you a report. Bang. <coughs> done. Two weeks. Okay. Licensed and in use in the US. Uh, hasn't come to Canada yet. We're working on trying to get it for research uh, as a first step. Uh, but the, the, the old Holter recorder is on its way out. Five, ten years from now, there'll be no more Holters. The, uh, the upside with Holters is they're cheap. Uh, because once you buy the equipment, you're basically paying for batteries and electrodes and, uh, and staff. Mostly uh, batteries and electrodes. But think of the convenience for the patient who can shower the next day. Uh, doesn't have to change batteries. Just slap it on and forget about it. Right? So, the invasive strategy. So the next version of the uh, loop recorder is going to be a tiny little injectable device, kind of like a Norplant for, uh, for contraception. So uh, am I allowed to say that at St. Paul's? <laughs> uh, so uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this device, uh, the intent is literally to be able to inject this device in in the office, in the emergency room. Uh, and the idea here is you have syncope, you come to the emergency room, you qualify, <coughs> as it were. Uh, the eMERGE physician or the, neuro the neurologist, the neurologist puts the device in or, uh, or the community practitioner and the patient gets a little thing that right now would be a dedicated, looks like your iPhone, in principle could be something uh, integrated with an iPhone uh, and that device has a three year memory and again the ability to interact without having to come to hospital. So that could have a few uses try to figure out what's going on with our patients and so on. Um, outstanding potential to be a, 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 a step up in our ability to record things. But an ECG is a pretty small start, right? There's a bunch of other physiologic things that we're interested in and trying to figure out syncope. So anybody here work in an animal lab that does blood pressure monitoring? Two hands, Keith and Bruce, okay. So uh, if you work in an animal lab that does blood pressure or does hypertension work, you'll be familiar with this. So this little device, you can see how small it is, gets inserted into an artery. Uh, it's typically inserted by a, a surgeon from a foreign uh, uh, medical system who can't uh, recertify here, so he works as a med tech in a lab. Um, and so you see here, here's the device, uh, here's the tip of that going in through the, uh, 
uh, through the arterial system into the ascending aorta. Uh, and then that gives us three months of beat to beat blood pressure. Every single beat. Would you like to know that in your heart failure patient to figure out why they are hospitalized every month? Would you be willing to spend $1,000 to save three $10,000 hospitalizations? Would we have to take something from one budget and put it into a different budget to do that? These are radical thoughts that seem kind of logical, okay? But, but we also need someone with the invasive skills to be able to do this. So there's a very small number of people who are, uh, have the capability of doing arterial surgery to implant a monitor like this. But the point is it's possible. And if it's possible, it's not just a little bit of engineering and tweaking to make it practical, uh, but it, it means we can get long-term beat-to-beat blood pressure information on people. So do you think our fidelity around treating hypertension could be improved by knowing what people's blood pressure is, as opposed to knowing what their home blood pressure is periodically? I suspect so. Um, how about you heart failure folks? So would you like to know left atrial pressure all the time? Seems like a good idea. So uh, later this year, in October of this year, uh, this trial, which is called Laptop HF, will look at the incremental value of having a left atrial pressure sensor in the management of heart failure to try to reduce hospitalization and healthcare <coughs> resources. Uh, clinical trial enrolling 750 patients randomized to usual care, uh, typically with a CRT defibrillator, uh, or I the incremental value of knowing left atrial pressure. So we're moving in the direction of getting more dynamic and long-term information. How about you coronary folks? So uh, you put stents in lots of these people who have acute coronary lesions like my guy George. And, uh, and so here is a device that's a stent that has a pressure sensor at either end of the stent. So in stent restenosis, stent thrombosis and so on, wouldn't you like to know what the pressure is on either side of your stent? We could stop doing all these MIBIs and stress tests and things on these people. And in fact, we could have this thing transmit to your phone, tell you when your flow is less than 70%. Okay, not bad, kind of cool. Okay, uh, top section of the slides cut off. I should, I should remember to make these smaller. Oh, you're gonna fix that for me. Oh, cool. Okay, so this is the risk watch. So this is a device that uh, measures your blood pressure. And uh, the question was, how reliable is it at uh, detecting your blood pressure? So <coughs> what crazy people like me did who like to induce ventricular fibrillation in patients when we put ICDs in them is put this device onto a patient while they were having ventricular fibrillation induced. And so in fact what you get is you get something that can detect when you're pulseless. Okay? Now that implanted loop recorder that we were talking about has the ability to work with Bluetooth. The problem with Bluetooth is it's very energy intensive and so in fact it depletes the battery rapidly. So you have a pulse, heart rate, Bluetooth monitor. You now have a 911 monitor. So you now have a completely different way of approaching sudden death recognition, not prevention, but at least recognition and early response because the major limitation with resuscitation is the time to resuscitation. So we know ICD patients almost never drop dead because the time to resuscitation is 15 seconds. So if you have the risk watch and you're in the network and you can overcome all of the big brother and privacy issues, you have a population with the immediate ability to detect an emergency, okay? As opposed to waiting for a first responder. So that could be a game changer in the area of recognition and treatment of sudden death, not prevention, not identifying who it's going to happen to, but imagine if, you know, the latest fashion statement was everybody wears a wristwatch. Okay, and whether that'll work, what the false positive, there's lots of issues to sort out, but the point is we're moving in the direction of understanding and be able, being able to get this information. So here's our man. So he got an implanted loop recorder because his wife was very worried. He wasn't all that convinced. Uh, and here's what happened nine months later. So it stands to reason that our conventional technologies, if you like, would not have been there uh, nine months later with a Holter or an external loop recorder or something like that. Uh, and this illustrates it. So he's chugging along here in sinus rhythm. For people who don't look at rhythm strips, we'll walk you through this just a little bit. So we have a nice P wave QRS and a T wave here. And then we have a PVC come along. And then the next P wave here blocks. And then the next one blocks after that. This is something called phase four block. 
And so he has what I call Nebs disease. Anybody know what Nebs disease is? Not enough heartbeats. <laughs> okay? So, so I, have a, I have a great slide of one of our referring humorous uh, docs who was a, a friend of mine back in uh, Ontario who, who wrote in a spot like this. He said, insert pacemaker here. <laughs> okay? So, but what's really interesting about this slide? Anybody want to point out what's interesting? There's something much more interesting than what I just told you. He has QT prolongation. He has QT prolongation. So this is called guilt by association. You talk to a QT genetics guy and you're guessing that's what's likely on his mind. So that, that may be the case. It's hard to know what the QT is because of the funny shape of the T wave. It's different than what you would get from a surface ECG. It's a good point. To me, what was really interesting is that a sinus rate slows down. Okay? So he has a secondary vagal cardioinhibitory response to asystole induced by a PVC with phase 4 block. Okay, so this is very complicated. Why does this happen? And then ironically, when a sinus node almost stops, a PVC, in fact, starts him back up again. So what got him into trouble gets him back. Okay, so does this mean that, uh, could this be part of why PVCs and AV block have some faint association with sudden death? Maybe. But again, we need to record this. We need to understand the dynamic nature of the disease to sort of get our heads around it. So, so here's another example of where we've advanced. So um, I don't know how many, relatively few people were sort of alive and reading the news in 1952 in this room, I'm guessing. Um, but uh, I found this interesting when I read up about this. So there was a, uh, the great smog of 1952 uh, was one of the first things that identified the implications of pollution uh, on risk of respiratory and to some degree cardi cardiac or cardiovascular death as well. So this was what's called a anticyclone. I have no idea what that is, but it sounds bad. Um, a funny uh, turn of weather, and because everybody in London at the time was burning coal to heat their houses, there was this smog that sat over London for four days, from December 5th to December 9th. And this is what happened. Death rates tripled, okay? And many of those deaths were respiratory exacerbation related. Some of them were, the rest were cardiovascular related. Uh, and so, and somebody very thoughtful, so this is a good sign. So here's somebody who does the five year weekly death rates. So you see they're sort of 1700 to 1900. And then you can see the two, the two weeks after the great smog, deaths <coughs> double and then quadruple. So this goes back to Sammy's nice rounds last week talking about the environmental effects. And so this got me thinking a bit, uh, this is why this slides in here, is after Sammy's rounds. Um, last week, uh, Circ Circulation published a paper that said that uh, pollution levels combined with ozone levels increase your risk of having out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So in fact, if you look at the hours before a cardiac arrest happens, uh, in the one to three hours before, increased uh, 20 parts per billion of this, uh, what they were measuring as a metric of pollution, uh, was associated with a 4% increased risk of cardiac arrest. Okay, so now we're building our model, right? Now we're adding other things into the mix. Uh, and we also know that atrial fibrillation is more likely to happen in pollution. So why would that be? Is this biologically plausible? Sure it is. So uh, Kumar Nantha Kumar at UHN in Toronto has a nice uh, pollution model up on, I think it's on Simcoe Street, where they have actually people breathe in concentrated versions of the air that's in Toronto. Um, and it, most of you know when you get off the plane now, having moved, I come here, the air is so fresh and so on. We go to Toronto, it's a, bit, it's a bit foul and so on. But essentially what he's doing is he's overdosing people with Toronto air. <laughs> and what he is showing is that in fact you can measure ECG changes, including changes in your QT interval, when you increase the dose uh, of Toronto air. Okay, so it makes, and this is biologically plausible because we know that those changes increase your risk of sudden death. So, again, we now th have to think about those environmental factors and how they add to our model of sudden death. So, in the end, his proposal is we have many components of our environment that are engineered, some of which we can uh, control and some of which we can't. And they all play into our conventional concepts of risk of cardiovascular and particularly coronary disease. Uh, and, and that's summarized in this slide. So uh, Mark and uh, Bruce told me there would be lots of people from basic science here, so I, I, I have a few things I did some thinking about 
about uh, excitation, contraction, coupling, and so on, where we're making process, uh, progress. So here on the top left, so this is the first paper that was in Nature. It was a pretty good journal back then, too, um, that talked about excitation, contraction, coupling. And then there were a flurry of really great, interesting papers that I read the abstracts of uh, between then and 1963. Uh, and and uh, But they, they basically started with relatively simple, they were literally putting electrical stimuli on little strips of frog muscle. Pretty simple stuff, but they were essentially showing uh, the basis of excitation contraction coupling. By the 80s, we're starting to build this model here. It's getting a little more complex. We're starting to understand intracellular calcium regulation, okay? So this is one from 2009. And uh, a, a friend of mine I was talking to genetics about who's from Calgary, <coughs> um, uh, Hank Ter Kerr, said, I'll send you a little article to sort of get you up to speed a bit. It's kind of a focused review. It was 87 pages. <laughs> Okay, just to kind of help me with my calcium skills, which are modest. So, uh, men are from Venus and women are from Mars. We know we're not the same. Um, many of us who talk to patients recognize that uh, women will say that some of their health states are different according to their estrogen cycle. So, here are some people who did something I thought was pretty interesting. So, what they did is they combined two factors, right? So, now we're not just thinking in terms of fix the model. We're now moving two factors within the model and looking at that effect. So what they did was they simulated different phases of the menstrual cycle and they, all, they used something like sodalol to block the potassium channel to try to make one more prone to arrhythmia. And what they found is that during certain phases of the menstrual cycle they could induce the arrhythmia and in others they couldn't. Okay? Conceptually, it sort of makes sense. People say, oh, it's always worse just before my period. So, it may not just be hearsay or pattern or association like a population scientist would think. There may be a biologic basis to it. And now, in fact, potentially we can try to record that, understand that, and then develop ways to identify and potentially either prevent or treat that. Um, so, you know, don't take sodalol just before your period. Might be crazy, but maybe you're more vulnerable dur during different parts of, the, uh, of your menstrual cycle. So, for you geneticists, uh, this is uh, uh, something very dear to my heart. This is the realm of long QT syndrome. So this is an inherited uh, familial basis for sudden death. Uh, and uh, so what these guys did, these are three guys from Hopkins um, who had uh, some supercomputers and it took them two and a half years. So you can imagine it was a slightly complicated process. And what they did is they essentially searched the internet for everything that's known about genetics and everything that's known about <coughs> the QT interval and looked for overlap in that complicated network. And uh, what they did with that is they said, well, what genes do we know? What, what's the strength of association of the genes and the QT interval? Because we think that would be related to long QT syndrome and so on. So the good news is the things that were sort of in the center of this are the genes that are known to call f cause familial autosomal dominant long QT syndrome. But then they found 55 other, this is the ones in the yellow here, 55 other nodes in that complex network that seem to have something to do, but the strength of the association is a little weaker. And then we go out to 360 nodes that are very weak associations. And then after that, we just get out into all of those protein-protein interactions and gene-protein interactions. But in effect, we have 55 new genes that we might think have something to do with long QT. And we know that patients we see with apparent long QT syndrome, the genetics are helpful, but often not helpful or not completely explanatory. So, they then took this information and said, so what? So what are you going to do with this? Again, these guys are not cardiologists, they're not electrophysiologists, they're not clinicians. And they said, um, let's look at the adverse drug reaction reporting across the US and look at QT-mediated sudden death or cardiac arrest and look at how those drugs are associated. So they took all those reports and they dismissed all the drugs that were known to prolong the QT interval. So they said, what's left? And there are several, and uh, there are two of them are illustrated here. So this is a cancer drug. This is a motility drug that's not an IKR blocker like cisopride is. And they said, why would those drugs be related to the QT interval and cause QT effects? There's just too many isolated reports for it to be an accident. And so the answer is, these drugs have to go through three or four pathways to get to the long QT genes in terms of their regulatory effect. But if your potassium is a little low and you're on, uh, on uh, uh, sodalol and someone adds a quinolone antibiotic which blocks your IKR and then you're treated for cancer, that's the final, that's the last <coughs> straw. Because of that complex interaction, 
it actually helps us understand why those drugs are associated with QT mediated arrhythmias. So again, that sort of complex thinking meshed with dynamic thinking might actually move us forward in how we think about things. So here's my simple start at our collective ability to do something like this. And that's our being <coughs> at FEST or here in BC. So just an example. Uh, I come from a realm where in my mindset uh, atrial fibrillation has been an EP doctor's disease. You have an EP uh, runs a clinic on atrial fibrillation. Turns out EPs, there's five great AF clinics here. Largely run by EPs. Sees, sees, uh, the EPs see 1% of patients with AF in BC. So we're irrelevant. Okay? AF clinics see 5% of AF in BC. So we're largely irrelevant. Okay, so 95% of people don't see experts in atrial fibrillation management. So uh, when I came to VGH, uh, Ken Jin's the director of the AF clinic. And he's not an electrophysiologist. And I thought, oh, well, we should just get one of our young hot guns to take over. And then I rethought that. And as, as I sort of get to this point, I said, no, you know what? Not only should Ken, maybe we should have a family physician run the atrial fibrillation clinic. It's very paradoxical, very unconventional thinking. It's hard to sit at the top of the ivory tower when you're down there with the masses, right? So my point is we've got a whole bunch of people who manage atrial fibrillation and we need to bring those people together because atrial fibrillation causes its own symptoms, it causes stroke, it causes heart failure. We actually have lots of good therapies and we mostly don't give them to people. It goes largely unrecognized or when it shows up it's because we're running there with a fire extinguisher when atrial fibrillation becomes a problem, rather than understanding and preventing it. So you can see here, and I've just done this sort of a very simplistic way of trying to say, all these people can come together to collectively identify, treat, manage, and advance the health of people with atrial fibrillation. Uh, and most of these people are doing this, but they're doing it largely in isolation. So this is my chief hat on, saying we have the potential, if we can work together and communicate better, to actually move the care of patients with atrial fibrillation along. And then recognize and foster those water cooler moments, those Alistair and me on the golf course moments kind of things where we can actually talk about stuff to make things better. So here's another way discovery happens. I've got two examples of this in my closing moments. So this is the original notion, and many of you with gray hair will remember, the notion that peptic ulcer disease was contagious was heresy. How could that be? We've seen the acid, the holes in the stomach, we've cut the vagus nerve, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then somebody proved this. And now uh, we sort of think of that as sort of witchcraft and uh, uh, leeches and burning witches and so on. Um, so in fact, this was the paper that said, think differently, rethink this. So Brenda Gruel is a uh, MD, PhD in Calgary who's German. And uh, she was doing her uh, doctoral studies in a lab that was looking at the basis of right ventricular cardiomyopathy for six years. And what they were trying to do was figure out why this disease happens, because this affects the right ventricle more than the left, and cells, literally, uh, muscle is replaced by fat and fibrous tissue, and patients predominantly present with arrhythmias. So they're chugging away, looking at and doing cellular stuff, trying to figure this out and so on. And the lab next to them is a cancer lab. And they're working on novel therapies to try to understand how to <coughs> reduce metastasis by reducing cell adhesion. So those little nasty cells can't find a place to latch on. So they're working with compounds that do this, and they've given these things this compound. And, uh, and uh, so in fact, they found some compound that works very well. And the problem is when they give it to an animal, the animal develops this cardiomyopathy that looks like this. So Brenda is having coffee with the people from the lab next door. And they say, look at this heart. Doesn't this sort of look like what you guys have been beating your head against the wall with in the last six years? So, aha! We now understand that ARVC is a desmosome disease. It's a cell adhesion disease. Quickly take those big families that we couldn't figure out, sequence their adhesion genes. Now we know what ha why ARVC happens. Five different genes that are all desmosome genes are the basis of familial ARVC. So this is, you know, serendipity. Bring it on, right? The good news, I think, is those kind of things can be less and less frequent because of this. 
More information has been generated since 2006 than existed before 2006. So our ability to both generate and communicate information is we don't have to have coffee with the person in the lab next door to make all of our inadvertent and apparently enlightened discoveries. So our communication tools are better. We need to communicate personally, but we also need to use all the resources are, that are available to us communication-wise to be able to, if you like, not rely on accident to make some of those discoveries. So in the end, I think the new scientific method takes into account all of these things and keeps shuffling them around, both in external and internal communications, to make us better. And potentially something like atrial fibrillation could be a place to start, at least in our little neck of the woods. So my last point about communication is illustrated by Steve here. So Steve says, if you want to buy my motorcycle, this bike is perfect, only 7,000 kilometers. It's had its 1,500 <coughs> kilometer check. No falls or scratches. I'm selling it because it was purchased without proper consent of a loving wife. <laughs> Apparently, do whatever you want doesn't mean what I thought it meant. <laughs> Okay, so, so in conclusion, I think we understand the acute nature of disease uh, and we need to work on the dynamic nature of disease. Um, we're on track to recording the dynamic nature of disease and I think that will inform, uh, with the complexity of disease, uh, substantially altering the course of disease in whatever realm you work with. I challenge this group as opening fest, as the BC cardiorespiratory community, to use this festival, this uh, networking opportunity, this uh, uh, wonderful four million person lab we work in uh, to make it better for the people around us and really advance our understanding of disease. Thank you. <laughs>